Yeah, Amar. Uh, yeah, good morning. Yes. Good morning, participants. Uh, once again, I welcome you all for the third day of faculty development program. Today we have another wonderful resource person, Dr. Dharma Singh, Associate Professor from IIT Bombay. He's done a lot of work in the areas of bitumen and concrete swimming. So uh, now I request uh, my colleague, Mr. Chaitanya, to introduce Dr. Dharma Singh. Good morning, participants. Myself, Chief Chaitanya, Ashwin Professor in the Department of Civil Engineering, RJ Kati RK Valley. I am here to give a brief introduction on Dr. Dharmir Singh. So, Dr. Dharmir Singh is an Associate Professor at Department of Civil Engineering in Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Bombay. Dr. Singh did his Master of Technology and Transportation Engineering from IIT Kharagpur, and he obtained his PhD degree in Civil Engineering from University of Oklahoma, USA. Dr. Singh research areas include rheological characterization of bitumen, mix design, performance, and durability of bituminous mixes, recycling of mixes, application of stabilizing layers in pavements, forensic investigation of pavements, identifying additives and materials. Apart from this, Dr. Singh presented his research findings in many international conferences in China, Hong Kong, USA, Germany, Greece, Sri Lanka, and India. He has also been invited by many private and government agencies and institutions for delivering lectures on specific topics and training of engineers. Dr. Singh has published over 100 papers in international journals and conferences. And Dr. Singh has conferred with IRC Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru Bhatsandhya Award 2018 by Indian Roads Congress and Bihar PWD Medal for Best Papers on Road Research Work, Indian Roads Congress, Nagpur Session 2018. He is an active reviewer of many repeated international journals such as ASC, ASTM, IJP, RMPD, Elsevier, and Springer. Dr. Sanghi is closely associated with several professional organizations such as Life Fund of Indian Roads Congress, Institute of Urban Transport India, ASC, and ASTM. He has been awarded as the best reviewer for ASC Journal of Performance of Constructed Facilities. Dr. Singh is an associate editor of Innovative Infrastructure Solutions, Springer publisher and editorial board member of International Journal of Payment Research and Technology and International Journal of Road Materials and Payment Design. We are happy to have you here, sir. Over to you, sir. Yeah. yeah, Dr. Amar? Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to share the screen, right? Yes. Please, your video. Uh, there is an echo from your side, it seems, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Amar, can you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, uh, and I hope all the uh, participants can hear me. I think yes. <clears throat> okay, and uh, we have muted everybody and then, you know, like, uh, things should go fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sir. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so, uh, very good morning to all of you. And Dr. Amar, we have one hour, right? Okay, so very good morning to all of you. Uh, we are going to talk about the design and construction aspects of dowel bars for concrete payments. You know, you know about the design of the and that in today's presentation, you may find some of the things which might motivate you to rethink about the dowel bars and the role of the dowel bars, how, the, how important the dowel bars are, and what are the level of information that you require for the design of the dowel bar and also for the construction of the dowel bars. So a lot of details are going to come gradually. But before I go to this presentation, I would sincerely would like to acknowledge many of the researchers 
experts, those who have published very interesting papers on this particular topic. In fact, all the teachers and all the friends, colleagues, those who you know, like teach every day about different, different kind of things. And my friend, Mr. Parveen Survey, who has really helped me to understand the topics related to concrete payments. Professor Neeraj Butch, and I was fortunate to attend this GAN course in IIT Madras. And of course, my students, those who are here, some of them might be attending. And they are the inspiration and they are the motivation to do something good. And of course, last but not the least, Dr. Amar, who has provided me this opportunity. And thank you to Rajiv Gandhi University of Knowledge Technologies, RK Valley, for giving this platform to talk about some kind of technical things. Now, many of the things in this presentation has been taken from the open resources. The purpose of taking the slides or maybe taking some kind of information, it's merely for the educational purpose. In fact, references has been given, but sometimes quite possible the references might be missed. So I apologize for that in, in, in well in advance. Now let's talk about the cross section of the concrete payment. If you see this, <clears throat> this particular cross section, there is a subgrade, there is a GSB layer, there is a DLC and PQC. In this particular lecture, we are not going to talk about how to design the concrete payment. We are talking about the dowel bars. In fact, we are also not going to touch upon the tie bars. So I will keep my focus only on the dowel bars. Now, if you see this particular configuration, this is two lane highways, and there is a tight shoulder. If you see where are the dowel bars, definitely this is the traffic direction. These are the dowel bars. On all contraction joints or transfer joint, you have the dowel bars. We design the dowel bar, we provide the dowel bar. Why do we do that? And how it is going to impact the performance? That's what we're going to learn. Now, if you see the typical layout of the concrete pavement, let's say, for example, in this case, there's the two lane highways. Direction of traffic is given to you. <clears throat> and if you see the dowel bar here, this is panel number one, this is panel number two, for example. You can see the dowel bars on all the contraction joints. And we have also given the details about the dowel bars. Now, if you see here, the dowel bar, we have 32 mm. Length is also given, spacing is also given to you. This is the typical drawing. Like for any structural uh, drawing, we have to provide the drawing. This is the typical drawing. Now, in this photograph, you notice there is something color change actually here. There is a brown color, there is a little bit kind of blackish color. What is that? And what is the importance of that? In fact, color doesn't have any meaning here, but there is a, some other things which we are going to talk about. Just keep that in mind, actually, what we are going to link later on in this presentation. Now, if you talk about the definition as per our Indian standards or guidelines that we have IRC 58 2015, definitely the load transfer is required from panel to panel. <clears throat> you require some kind of mechanical correction, connection. Now, the mechanical connection can be there with aggregate interlocks or you may have this kind of steels, mild steels. That's what we're going to talk about. Now, you have the dowel bar at the contraction joints. What are the other locations that you have the dowel bars? Can you think about that? What are the other locations that we have the dowel bars? If you go into the design components of the payment, rigid payments, 
you are going to see we require the dowel bars at contraction joint, expansion joint, and construction joints. Are we going to design it differently? Yes, there are a little bit change into the design. We are going to talk about that. Why do we need to provide the dowel bars at the construction joints? We understand the dowel bar we see or the contraction joint, expansion joint we also see, but why do we need to provide, provide at the construction joints? We are going to talk about that later in this particular presentation. Now, if you go through the literature, in fact, earlier we have seen a lot of doll bars are there in the panel. But if you go through the literature, in fact, if you see IRC 58 2015 also, there is a statement, more doll bars may be provided under the wheel path of heavy commercial vehicles. What does it mean? Why this statement has been given? In some country, there is a practice to provide more dowel bars on the wheel path. If you see here, if I assume this is my wheel path here, I am going to provide more dowel bars on the wheel path. I am not going to provide any dowel bars in the in between. There's the one particular techniques. Other techniques is, is can be there where you have the equal spacing of all the dowel bars, or you may have the different spacings also of the dowel bars. So what we understood, dowel bars definitely required, but do we need to really provide only on the wheel path or everywhere? Or do we need to change the spacings and everything? Now, if you see in India, the practice is, we are not following the practice of providing only on the wheel path. We are providing everywhere. And also, we are not changing the spacing. We are providing the uniform spacing everywhere. But the purpose of showing this slide is so that you know this is another concept which is there in the literature. In fact, some country practice it. But in India, we don't know how the, you know, like the wheel path is going to be because we have a lot of wheel wonders sometimes. So that you have to keep in mind. Now, so, uh, I cannot hear what you are talking about. No, there are some disturbance. No problem. Okay, okay. Now, if you see the response of the undoweled joint or only aggregate interlock, please try to pay the attention on, on the wording that I'm using here undowel joints or only aggregate interlock. Now, here we have only aggregate interlock. There is no dowel bar. Now, if you see the wheel load is coming here, now this particular joint is going to get deflected. Now, you need to rethink about that. How long the aggregate interlock can work? Can it work a couple of years? Maybe you say 10 years, 5 years, or other question comes, will it going to work for the heavy loading? Right? These are the typical questions that we need to think about. Now, the aggregate interlock is okay. This will work for the low volumes or for lightweight. But if you don't have the proper load transfer, then you are going to see this kind of problem happens. There is a heavy stresses, high deflection, definitely your payment is going to fail. And you're also going to see the mud pumping also may happen actually from these particular joints. So we understood the importance of the joints and importance of the aggregate interlocking, how we can go to the dowel joints now. Let's talk about the dowel joints. Now, if you have the dowel joints, in fact, I'm writing here plus, if you pay the attention to the plus here, the purpose of writing plus is you have the mechanical joint, which is the dowel bar, plus there is also aggregate interlock. So both, both the things are together, but we are relying heavily on the dowel bars because that's the kind of main purpose. This is what it is going to be at the load. Now, if you have the dowel bar, definitely there is low deflection, the low deflection, low stresses. And we are going to talk about that. What is the load transfer efficiency of a dowel bar joints that we are going to discuss later on? 
Now, if you go as per IRC 50 2015, there is a statement for heavy traffic greater than 450 CVPD, dowel bars are provided at contraction joints since the aggregate interlock cannot be relied upon. That's what we saw in the last slide. You cannot trust on the aggregate interlock how it is going to work. That's how we have to be more conservative to provide the dowel bar. Now, let's see further. If you go through the literature, there is a lot of finite, finite element analysis, FEM analysis has been done into the literature. This is your non dowel joint. This is your dowel joints. And you can see the deflection here. And you can see the deflection in this particular. So this is again to support the hypothesis that dowel bar helps to reduce the deflection. They really helps to provide the better performance of the payments just to support that particular uh, hypothesis or understanding. Now, again, if you do further, you know, like going to the modelings and FEM and all, you're also going to see the known dowel joints, the maximum stress at bottom, maybe this much. And if it is dowel joints, you're going to see the less magnitude of the stress. But bear in mind, this may be for particular conditions. If you change the wheel load, if you change some certain conditions, definitely the stresses are going to be different. But you may find a similar trend. That's what we are going to talk about. Now, the jo joint faulting, if at any particular joint, for example, these are the longitudinal uh, these transfer joints here, you see there is a difference in the elevation between these two slabs. This is called joint faulting. Now, this is a functional failure. Your slab may be OK. This is uh, structurally, it is very, very good. It may sustain maybe like next, uh, next 20, 25 years. But functionally, this is not going to work because this may result in very high IRI value. The riding quality gets impacted heavily. Now, what are the reasons behind that? And what is the mechanism of this? Or regions and mechanism has to be understood. Why this slab is going down? Why this slab it, it remains here? So there is something going on in the load transfer from one slab to other slab. Now, there can be different regions for that. Maybe the dowel bar was not designed properly. Maybe there is a corrosion in the dowel bars. Maybe there is an inappropriate size of the dowel bar or heavy traffic is there. Or sometimes there might be some localized issue beneath the particular panel. Maybe your base has some problem. Quite possible. So this is this is this is the importance of having the sound joint with the dowel bar. Now let's see this very interesting graph. Faulting is given on the x-axis. Cumulative percentage of sections. It means how many sections are going to pass within that particular range. Try to understand it. I will just spend maybe a little time on this. Now, this is our limiting values. If my faulting is less than 2 mm, <clears throat> I'm going to accept it. I say it is fine. There is no problem. But definitely, if the faulting goes more than 4 mm, and you know what is the faulting, the difference in the elevation between two slabs. Now, if you see the dowel joints, no dowel joints, there's a blue line here. This is a red line here. Let's talk about 2 mm faulting. At 2 mm faulting, you are going to see almost 90% joints are going to satisfy less than 2 mm. This is the cumulative graph. How about the dowel joint, non dowel joints? You are going to see around 60%. Likewise, that there is a very interesting observation here that I just wanted to tell you. Between 2 to 4, between 2 to 4 here, let's say, for example, if I assume this value is around 85, this value is around 60, so this is around 25%. 25% joints are between 2 to 4 mm faulting if the joints are non doubled. How about the double? Double, if you see 90 here, and if I assume this is close to maybe, let's say, 96, hardly 6% joints. Likewise, you can see 
other combinations also. So we understood that importance of the dowel bar is definitely cannot be ignored. We have to provide the good dowel bars. This is how it works. But how about the diameter of the dowel bars? Now, this is another very interesting observation. Again, faulting is they have here they have taken limit of 2.5 mm. This is the known dowel joints. This is the number of trucks per day. And if you see known dowel joint, the faulting keep on increasing with the time. But when you have the dowel joints with 25 mm dowel bars, 32 mm dowel bars, 38 mm dowel bars, definitely we see the faulting is reducing with the time. I mean, it's, it's definitely increasing, but there is a not significant change with the time. Now, if you talk about the quality of the steel for the dowel bar, what kind of steel is that? And if you see IRC 15, 2017, it says very clearly, mild steel grade one, it's not grade two, it is grade one mild steel. Now let's dig down into this particular IS standard. If you go to this particular IS standard, IS 432, and if I just see more than 20 mm dowel bar, it's here, I see the yield strength is around 240. Ultimate strength is, is 410, and elongation is 23%. So when dowel bar is to be selected, the quality check has to be done. You have to ensure that whatever steel you are procuring for the dowel bars, it has to go to the mechanical testing. You need to ensure that these quality parameters are met. And I'm not going to go into the details of how the tensile test has to be done. You can, you can see in a lot of literature, this kind of things you can find out actually. Now, if you go to the mass per meter, if I ask you a question, I have the dowel bar of, let's say, 0.5 meter length, 38 mm diameter. What is the typical weight of the dowel bar? What is the mass of the dowel bar? If you just carry in the hand, you need to feel some weight. It should not be like half kg or one kg. It has to have some weight. And there is a standard for that. It's not like some dowel bars are going to weight, let's say, 1 kg. Other dowel bars are going to weight 2 kg. There is a standard. And what is the standard? If you dig down into IS 1732, you are going to see these are the typical mass per meter. Now let's assume 38 mm is close to here. It means we may see the mass of that particular dowel bar that we have talked about close to maybe let's say 4.5 kg or something like that. That's quite heavy weight. This is how when you go to the field, you can just sense what kind of weight of the dowel bar is there. If you see the no dowel bar for thickness less than this is as per standard because people have shown that if you provide the dowel bar lesser than 2 mm thickness, it's not very effective. Though some people are trying for the, you know, like thin, uh, this uh, short panel concrete and all, but those dowel bars are not really this kind of range. They are hardly maybe 12 mm, 16 mm of tie bars kind of things. Now, what about the chemical composition? Because dowel bars can be different kind of material. By the way, if you go to the literature, you are going to find nowadays dowel bars of different materials. FRP dowel bars are also there, mild steel is also there, stainless steel is also there. There are different kind of dowel bars. In fact, you are also going to find different shapes of the dowel bar. Rectangular dowel bars are also there, dowel bar are also there, elliptical is also there, trapezoidal shape is also there. So there are different kind of dowel bars. So this is the chemical composition that we have to do. We have to ensure that it is meeting the <coughs> chemical composition requirement. Now let's talk about, in fact, I told you that we have different kind of joints that we are providing the dowel bars. Let's talk about the dowel bars at contraction joints. Now you pay the attention here. I'm not going to discuss all the parameters. I'm going to focus only on the dowel bar here. This is the dowel bar. And you see some kind of cover on top of the dowel bar. But we see cover on one side. We don't see cover on other side. 
we see the tie bars also here there is the length of the doll bar and we see this cover is up to certain length this particular cover there has to be minimum spacing between these doll bars and tie bars remember that you cannot keep on cutting this joint all the way down you have to make sure that there is enough cover above the tie bar also and you have to also make sure the tie bar is not resting on top of the doll bars there might be some performance issues that so this is how you have to design the layout first you have to check how the layout look like now let's talk about the doll bar at expansion joints try to pay the attention on the diagram now for the expansion joints definitely we have to provide the doll bars if you see there is a change in the layout the expansion joint we have a lot of expansion and typical joint width can be around 20 mm or so so you have to provide enough space to the doll bar so that it can freely move around but we did not do that for the contraction joint yes we didn't do that because if you see the contraction joint opening it's hardly 5 mm or in some cases maybe 6 mm so we don't expect that this the deform or the extension is going to be in that particular range now how about the doll bar at construction joints now this is interesting the doll bar at construction joint must be provided why it is so because we don't have any aggregate interlock at that particular point how come we don't have the aggregate interlock because we have constructed this particular slab now we are going to come back and construct another slab here if you see in this picture picture here so this is kind of a butt joint you can call it this is a butt joint there is no aggregate interlock so doll bar must be provided at the contraction joint it can have the same design what you have for the contraction joint in fact we have the similar the design may change by the way for the expansion joint because your expansion width is more so doll bar design sometimes may change and we are going to see that now if you see the placement of the doll bar in the field now we have we know what is the doll bar if you go to the field you are going to see in slip form paper there is a doll bar inserter there is also tie bar inserter tbi is also there dbi you are going to see and this is how you stock all your doll bars this is how you load them and this is how it goes and you can see slot here this is going to push around if you can see the mark here these are the typical mark so this particular slot is going to push it down so it means we have to calibrate it first it should not push at whatever the depth it want we have to calibrate this particular system once you calibrate that then you are pretty sure that this particular doll bar is going to go at that particular location now couple of thing i want you to pay attention here just see the color difference here and also see some kind of tape on this particular doll bars and when i finish this particular presentation you must be in the position to answer this question that i am asking right now now if you go to this dbi definitely that you have to first of all you need to know where are you going to fix the doll bar at what position transfer joint spacing but you know the dbi it also can be tricky affair sometimes you have to very very careful that what kind of mix you are using what kind of vibration you are applying in the slip form paper because ultimately if you think about the rheology of the fresh cement paste you have the now we know the typical the mass of the doll bar is around let's say 5 kg you have the 5 kg weight which is resting on the fresh cement paste and we are vibrating it definitely and then this dbi pushing it down but once this dbi pushes it down it doesn't mean the doll bar is going to be there if you have a lot of vibration this particular doll bar may try to go up 
So you have to very, very careful that what kind of mix consistency you require, what kind of vibration you require to ensure that Dalbert does not go here and there. Otherwise, you are going to see the Dalbert trails. You see there is a black, black line here. It means it, it's quite possible the dowel bar has uh, maybe shifted on the top, slightly, uh, you know, like misaligned. And this may also cause the crack sometimes later on. So we are going to see that. Now, another thing, if you see in the fixed form paper or the manual construction, you are also going to see the dowel bar cradles, or we call it dowel brackets. Now, if you see here, these are the dowel brackets because you cannot have DBI everywhere. Let's say, for, for example, urban roads or maybe the village roads or maybe some other locations, you require these cradles to be there. Now, if these are the cradles and you have the dowel bars, you just fix them on the ground, you fix them and they are fixed on the ground and then you pour the concrete. And now you know what is the length, uh, depth of this particular dowel bar, what is the spacing, what is the length, all these things are given to you. This is another dowel bar cradle you are going to see. Now, this is another question for you. Are you going to approve this dowel bar cradle design? How do you check the design of the dowel bar cradle? How do you ensure that this dowel bar cradle is going to be effective or it will not deflect when you load the concrete? If you ask me personally, I will not accept it. There are many reasons for that. The design is not appropriate. You can see there is no support below the dowel bars. So this kind of cradle is a poorly designed cradle. There are many issues in this particular cradle that you have to pay attention. In fact, I have seen not many people think about this particular cradle design. So I would encourage all the students, those who are here, think about this, read about that what kind of design component has to be involved in this. Now, when I talk about the dowel bar design, I'm not going to teach you here how to do the dowel bar design. I'm just telling you, when I say the design the dowel bar, it means tell me the diameter of the dowel bar, the spacing of the dowel bar, length of the dowel bar. These are the three things I want from you. For that, we require a lot of inputs. Now, these are the typical inputs that you require for the design of the dowel bars. First is your design load, load transfer efficiency, tide, whether you have the tight shoulder, untied shoulder, what is the joint type that you have, what is the material properties, concrete, you know, like elastic modulus and all, what is the foundation support? These are the typical input parameters. And you see, Dalbar is very, very sensitive to the input parameters. If you change the LTE, everything will change. If you change the tight to untied shoulder, things will change. If you change the design load smartly, Dalbar will change. Now the question comes, if I ask you a question, this is my typical XL load spectra, and I wanted to design the Dalbar. Now, if you see the single XL load, tandem XL load, tridem XL load, different kind of loading here. I see the frequency. Now, the question comes, what load is to be selected for the design of the dowel bars? Can I just select whatever I want? Or I can just select the standard axle, which is 80 kN, and go ahead. Or I need to select 98 percentile. Remember, earlier co, uh, IRC 58, they used to talk about the 98 percentile. Or maybe it has to be 90 percentile, 80 percentile. Do some literature review on that. Try to think about that. But if you ask me personally, I will definitely put my vote on this particular load. The maximum single axle load based on the axle load spectra is around 190 kilonewton. So 190 kilonewton is the single axle load that I'm going to select, which is more severe as compared to your tandem and tridem. Now, if you do some, you know, like kind of trick here, you just make it zero, zero, zero or something, definitely you may come up with here also, your design may change. So the question is, 
how much I need to trust on the Excel load spectra. Your design is, is, is going to be what you give the inputs. It doesn't have any emotions. You give the input, it will tell you the values. It doesn't tell you that I will fail in the future. But yes, you have to see what is the Excel load spectra you are going to really see in the field. There has to be some reliability into that. Now, when I go to the design of the doll bar, if you see the semantic of the doll bar here, you apply the load. Gradually with the time, in fact, if you see, there is a compressive stress here. This we call it the bearing stress. Maybe let's say one reputation, two reputation, three reputation, four, maybe thousand, millions and all. What do you think with the time going to happen? You know, this particular arrangement, whatever arrangement you see, the double bar is going to get a little bit loosened, right? With the time. Because we see this is how the compressive stress is going to work repeatedly. So there is a, also, you can see the cumulative fat, I mean, this compressive, you know, like load is coming up here. So we designed the dowel bar based on the bearing stress on the concrete. Now, what kind of load has to be taken? If you see the, the dowel bar here, this is the deflection and all. So the design is safe when your allowable bearing stress in the concrete is, is more than the actual bearing stress. Very simple calculation. And if you go into the detail, this is the allowable bearing stress, this is the maximum bearing stress. You can do calculation yourself. But one thing you try to notice here, and I would recommend all, you know, like youngsters, those who are working in this field, think about how many parameters are there. Do some kind of sensitivity analysis. Tell me the impact of this K value. Tell me the impact of this Z value, tell me the impact of, you can see everything is clubbed together. So, so many parameters you're going to see. And if you add low transfer efficiency and all kind of things, this becomes another complicated things. Now, what we assume here, the load, the shear, shear load actually, we're talking about the shear force. The shear force, if you see, it is going to transfer up to length of L. If you see earlier standard, I mean guidelines IRC, it was 1.8 I think 8 L. But whether 1.8 L is more conservative or 1 L is more conservative. In fact, some people say it is not even L. It is hardly 0.5 L. Or some people say it is hardly 0.4 L. If you find, if you go through the literature, you are going to find a lot of interesting things actually into the literature. So this is how the design has to be done. This is quite an interesting slide and I want you to think about that. Some people ask me a question, how do you decide the length of the doll bar? I mean, di diameter is okay, spacing is fine, but how do you decide the length of the doll bar? And if you see IRC 58 here, and usually I ask this question, why the length is, is decreasing? Why it is increasing afterwards? Now, if you go through the literature, you're going to find a lot of interesting thing in this. You see the, the distance from the joint face. Let's say, for example, this is your joint. This is my dowel bar. I'm talking about from here, I go inside. Now, the first inflection point and second inflection point and third inflection point, it means wherever no. it is happening, zero. Because the bar is going to deform. If you see, there's a maximum deformation here on the face of the uh, uh, concrete. You're going to see the first inflection point. You're going to the sec second inflection point. And if you see the shear force here, maximum shear force, first inflection point, if you see, it comes around uh, maybe close to six centimeter. If I go close to six centimeter, I'm going to see the maximum shear force. And if I go to the second inflection point, which is close to 20 centimeter, if I go 20 centimeter, it comes to here. You can do a couple of observations from here. First of all, as we talked about, that the shear force decreases to zero after 1.0 L. And L, let's say maybe L typically maybe around 600 
mm or 700 mm but this is quite low this is hardly 20 200 mm that's what i told you some people say the shear force is going to be zero after 20 cm after 30 cm so this is how you have to talk in fact in the literature they say you take the length up to second inflection point and if you see the second inflection point here which is around 20 cm 200 mm if you go other side which is also 200 mm 400 mm if you take maybe let's say joint width is around 5 mm or 10 mm it, it typically comes around 400 10 or 420 mm but to consider the misalignment the or you can, uh, kind of construction in the field you just be more conservative so i would consider whatever we have given in irc 58 it's more conservative side so no need to cut it down further now, if you see the typical design of dowel bar, and there are many components here, you can see there are a lot of components. And you can do the sensitivity analysis. Anybody can set up this Excel file. This is not a complicated thing. But I'm just showing you two example here. The 32 mm diameter, 350 mm spacing, 500 mm length. This is not safe. If I increase the diameter, it's safe. But there are many other points. If you see the contraction joint, and I assume the tight shoulder, tight shoulder, there are many other inputs that you can change. You can change the spacing also, you can change the diameter also, you can change the foundation support also, you can change the uh, uh, joint width also. A lot of things can be changed. And this is how your double bar design is going to change. And also, the important thing is the load. If you change the load, everything will change. So there are a lot of link to the design of the doll bar. I would encourage you to think about that. Now, this is another very interesting finding in the literature. You see the bearing stress that we talked about. This is the doll bar diameter. This is the spacing of the doll bar. This is the compressive stress or bearing stress. If I increase the doll bar diameter, in fact, the bar diameter is, is increasing this direction. If you increase the bar diameter, let's say, for example, in our case, 38 mm. So 38 mm, I'm going to put it somewhere here. And you say the spacing is uh, 300 mm. So 300 mm is here. Now, if you go here, so what you see from here, if you decrease the bar diameter, compressive stress is going to be very, very high, right? So this is how you have to think about how the compressive stress can change or there's a function of the various parameters. Now, some people have a tendency of thinking that let's provide a lot of dowel bars. I have seen in the practice, some people think that, okay, instead of uh, 350 mm uh, center to center, let's make it 200 mm center to center. But remember, this is a joint, this is a mechanical joint. Like you have the shoulder, sometimes your shoulder get stiffened, right? You cannot move it. It's a lot of, it's kind of lock. You cannot move your shoulder. Similar thing happens to the joint also. If you really provide a lot of dowel bars, your joint is going to lock. Shear action will not happen. Deflection will, there is a issue is going to come up. So you have to be very, very careful that you really don't provide a lot of dowel bars. Otherwise, you are going to see there's a locking of the joints. Now, another important thing I usually talk to many people about the anti-corrosion coating. Now, you should ask question to yourself, what kind of coating are we providing in India? What is the type of the coating that we're providing? How, what is the thickness of the coating? How do I check it? What is the abrasion resistance of the coating? How do I check it? So all these things we have to think about. Now, the, this coating is very, very important. If you, in fact, if you see IRC 58, there is a statement given. The coating is required. If you see, these are the, after five years, this is the different kind of coatings here. But if you see, there is the corrosion. What is going to happen if the dowel bar get corroded? If the dowel bar get corroded, you think about that. Definitely, it is going to eat the dowel bar diameter. The dowel bar diameter may, will decrease your strength will decrease, your performance of the joint will decrease. So you need to really protect it. Now, I have seen sometimes in the field, the dowel bar is coated properly, but I see the patches of uncoating here and there. That's not going to work. 
if you have the coating of the dull bar it has to be consistent otherwise if you leave the patches here and there it's not going to work out now this is i told you in the beginning you notice the color two different colors remember in the layout i told you that there is a brown color you know like the black, uh, kind of blackish color if you see the dull bar there is a seething now if you see here this is the dull bar this is the seething here there is a the plastic cover which is around 0.5 mm thickness not more than that and which has which has to cover around 60% length of the dull bar so you can see this is around 60% length of the dull bar for the contraction joint and for expansion joint is also given here the purpose is so that we don't lock the joints it has the you know like capacity to move around little bit because there is a, again going to be expansion and contraction on the contraction joint also so you need to leave one particular joint some moment has to be there so therefore you are not providing the seating other side you are just providing a 60 percent of the length but then the question comes how to ensure if the seating will allow movement of the dull bar i mean what is the guarantee that i i put the seating and then it does not allow the movement of the dull bar possible quite possible if you have the dull bar which is having the seating on top of that and if you think it is not allowing the dull bar to move then it is not going to work now the question comes how do i check do i have some kind of testing to do yes we can do some interesting test if you go to the literature there is a pull out test this is your you have to cast a beam you have the dull bar you have the seating here you apply the tensile force and if you see irc 15 2017 very clearly statement is written here a seven day tensile load shall be applied here and the moment has 2.25 we have to find out what is the average bond strength stress in this particular situation and this should not be more than 0.14 mpa now some people get confused here why it should not be 0.14 mpa it should be more we want more bonding but remember we are checking the seating the quality of the seating actually this is not tie bar design tie bar design definitely you need more bonding more shear uh, you know like the bond stress so if you see the testing data here this is the kind of testing data on an average it is coming 0.11 so this is another parameter that you have to think so dull bar design is not simply you just go 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 with this diameter length and spacing there are a lot of construction issues that you have to think about now another important thing i told you that there is a tape here why we are applying the tape just i will draw a schematic diagram this is let's say dull bar here now if i put the seating here now if you don't apply the tape what is going to happen there there are quite high chances that aggregate some particles may go inside possible if it happens for example what is going to happen it will it will again not function so what you do you try to seal it this is how it is and in fact i have seen the practice in the field some people don't even do that so you have to see what are the construction practices that you have to adopt now another thing comes to the load transfer efficiency i have a couple of questions here for you and when we go to go to the couple of slides i will be asking a couple of interesting questions to think about all for youngsters those who are working in this field now the load transfer efficiency is very very important parameter because we design the dull bar based on the ilte we are you 100% load transfer efficiency for the design of the dull bar now the first question come what is the load transfer efficiency how do i define that and if you see the literature they say the load transfer efficiency is the deflection on the unloaded slab divided by deflection on the loaded slab now this is your wheel this is your loaded slab because you are loading it this is your unloaded slab 
it will deflect. This, this is not deflecting here. So this is zero load transfer. If it is same deflection both side, let's say for example, one mm and one mm both side, I will say that the LT is 100%. So let, let's think about that. Now, how to measure the deflection? Now, for the deflection measurement, we use polymer deflectometer. If you see here, this is the polymer deflectometer. This is the joint here. And you can use polymer deflectometer for measuring the deflection. I'm not going to enter the detail of that. But deflection is also a function of Dalbar, the joint weight, the foundation stiffness, the temperatures. But just I'm telling the how to determine the LT of a joints. Now remember I told you that after some repetition, your dowel bar will lose a little bit. Now this is another interesting study. The looseness of the dowel bar and load transfer efficiency. And then K, this is the capital K, which is the modulus of dowel support. This is the maximum K here, which is 600 MPA per mm. My brother, but hello. So if you see the looseness of the dowel bar, and if you see the LT is decreasing, that makes sense to us. So this is also, in fact, supports our hypothesis that why we are talking about the dowel bar supports, why we are talking about the LT and all. Now, there are a lot of factors which can influence the load transfer efficiency. So don't think the load transfer efficiency is only about the dowel bars. If you have that conception, that's wrong. Don't think the load transfer efficiency is only about the dowel bar design. It is only about the spacing, length, and the diameter of the dowel bar. No. It is also function of other parameters. You have designed perfectly fine. Everything has been taken nicely. But there are many other factors which can also have the impact. You may have the improper placement of the dowel bar. You may have the poor base. The subgrade is a problem. Climate is a factor. I'm talking about the climate. What do you mean? Why I'm talking about the climate here? We're going to discuss it. So there are many factors that we have to think about. Now, this is a question for you. I want to find out load transfer efficiency. In the daytime, you know slab goes curl up. In the nighttime, this is the curl down. If I ask you a question here, if I do the load transfer efficiency of this particular slab and this particular slab, which one will give the more LT to me? Think for a second. Possible? You are going to the field with, let's say, maybe, for example, with following a deflectometer. You do the measurement of deflections, and you, you see this kind of situation sometimes in the daytime, night time, this situation, you do LT, which one is going to have more LT? Now, if you notice here, in this particular situation, your joints are going to lock. In fact, they are tightening up a little bit. So quite possible, you may see the less deflection. But here, your joints are opening up. It's like trying to open up. So you may see the more deflection. Now you may ask question, then when do I need to measure the LT? Is there any time that I need to measure the load transfer efficiency of a joints? Typically in the literature, you are going to find that the temperature around 20 to 25 or 23 degrees Celsius is okay. You may ensure that it is going to be you not know, like reliable LT. So this is another climate factor that I was talking to you. Now another question for you. I have four cases with me. Case number one, case number two, case number three, case number four. Deflection at the loaded slab is 0 0.04. Unloaded slab is given. I know how to calculate LT. What is LT? Deflection at. This is, I think, unloaded slab. And this is loaded slab. How to calculate LT? You know, 0 0.04 divided by this. Can you tell me which joint is fine? Which joint do you think is going to be excellent joint out of these four joints? Okay, I see 80% looks good. I see 83 looks excellent. 
I see 80, absolutely okay. This joint looks problematic to me because LT is very less. Do you think it is good? Because we are finding the load transfer efficiency, but there is a problem here. Now, LT is very, very deceptive term. It is a ratio. You are finding a ratio, but ratio can be anything. The ratio 4 divided by 5 is also 80. Ratio 0 0.04 divided by 0 0.05 is also 80. But if you see the real deflection, it is quite less in case number 1 as compared to case number 2. So what it tells me is that ratio is not going to work. I'm not getting the right sense from here. So in some of the literature, you are going to find the relative deflection. What is relative deflection? The difference between these two, if it is below 0 0.025, good, good, joint is good. Now, let's see how it's going to work. If you see the relative deflection in our first case, 0 0.01, third case, 0 0.01, it means this is good, this is good, this is not good, this is not good. So now you realize that there is something else going on. It's not simply ratio, the way we are talking about the LTE. It is about the performance of the payment, which also depends upon the deflection. Numbers are okay. Number you may say 80, 100%, but the deflection, how much deflection is happening? By the way, in the literature, you are also going to find another interesting theory. This is based on the differential energy. What is differential energy? This is how the differential energy has to be calculated. If you simplify this, you know, like this A square minus B square in your elementary school that you might have done. A plus B and A minus B. So A, A minus B is here. This is what we are talking about, A minus B. But you can also calculate the differential energy. If the differential energy is more, LT is less, faulting is more. So think about this particular parameter. Now, the last topic that we are going to talk, we are going to finish maybe next, maybe five to seven minutes. Alignment of the Dalbar. I want you to think about that. Just pay attention, I'm just going to explain it. These are the dowel bar. I'm talking about the longitudinal translation. What does it mean? It means the dowel bar may shift here and there. Longitudinally, it may shift, right? Possible, it may shift. Horizontal translation, it, may, it, may, it means the spacing may change. You have provided, let's say, 300 mm spacing, but the spacing is not 300, the spacing is 400 mm. Or you say the all bar is center to center here, I assume 250, 250, but in my case, I'm getting 300 this side, 200 this side. So longitudinal translation, horizontal translation, horizontal misalignment. You have provided the dowel bar very straight, but in some of the joint, you, find, you may find it has rotated. We call it horizontal misalignment or you some literature you are going, also going to find the rotation or tilt also you are going to find. In the bottom, you are going to see vertical translation. It means the shift. Remember, we are providing the dowel bar at the mid depth, but it may shift. Sometimes that's what we discuss. In the DBI also, it may happen. In the cradle also, it may happen if you are not designing it properly. So this kind of shift may be there. So this is the thickness of the slab. It may also tilt vertically. You have a dowel bar, but it will tilt. This is tilting horizontal. It may be anti-clockwise, clockwise. It may be down. It may be up. It may be up. It may be down. This may be this side. This may be this side. Anything is possible. But why we are talking about the dowel bar alignment? Are we really, do we really need to care about that? If you say yes, how do I check it? So that's what we are going to talk about. And do we have the, any specs in India for considering the alignment of the dowel bar? We are going to talk about that later. Now, if you follow the literature, what happens if you have the misalignment of the dowel bar? What happens in reality? Why do I need to care about that? Now, if you see, this is the horizontal translation, this is the longitudinal translation, the traffic is this direction. And if you see the horizontal skew, this is the tilt that I told you, horizontal uh, tilt is the vertical translation, it is the depth of the slab, 
the, the vertical till just remember this term that i'm using here and if you say the impact of this kind of misalignments the horizontal skew which is here it may cause spelling cracking load transfer also it may impact if you have the vertical tilt again you may have the impact of this if you have the vertical translation you may have the impact and in fact if you see carefully the load transfer efficiency is going to change whatever happens once it changes now you know how the load transfer efficiency has to be calculated what impact it has onto the design what in impact it has has onto the performance of the payment of the joint locking so faulting deformation deflection stresses cracking lot of things may come up now let's talk about what happens that these are the pictures some of the pictures of lock joint now as per ifc 15 2017 there are some standard tolerance is given to you now what is the tolerance let's again pay attention to the drawings that we have horizontal skew it means this is horizontal plane it may shift this side it may shift this side also from here less than equals to 10 mm i am going to accept it if it is less than equals to 10 mm vertical is going it, it can be up it can be down 10 mm right if you see the longitudinal translation it may shift here and there the misalignment we sometimes you know we are assuming 500 mm remember the length discussion that we had and i told you that we are on the conservative side the region is in the field sometimes you may have the misalignment in the horizontal direction maybe one side you have 300 mm other side you have 200 mm possible so that kind of tolerance is around plus i mean less than 50 mm depth wise you are putting your dowel bar here it can be plus minus 25 mm now if you read irc 15 2017 carefully it is written if more than half of the dowel bar at a joint don't meet any of this acceptance criteria that we have discussed then the joint shall be treated as a lock joint and it has to be rejected i have not seen so far actually if the joint has been rejected in the field because people say that dbi is going to give the accurate things but yes i mean as per the as per the protocol as per the standard as per this guidelines it has to be checked if it is so the dbi is so accurate then we should have not given this requirement so definitely we have to think about that what kind of alignment we are getting into the field and if the joint is locked you have to do the full depth repair again you have to do the reconstruction of that particular joint but there is a some frequency of that maybe the, if you check one joint one joint fails it doesn't mean that you just take out all the joints there is a some other way of looking into that also but the joints is all together another topic that you can take out now let's see the practice of some of the states in us what do they think about about the tolerance maximum rotation what is the rot rotation rotation means this these are the rotations vertical translation it mean depth depth wise longitudinal it means shift here and there if you see we have requirement of less than 10 mm but i see typically almost same requirement around 6 mm 6 mm 14 mm so we are fine i think we are with the as far as the specification is concerned we are okay actually with that vertical translation about the depth up and down we have plus minus 25 mm i think also we are fine and some literature they say 1 by 10 1 by 10th of the slab thickness longitudinal translation also there so as as far as specs are concerned we are fine but the point here is how to measure the alignment of the dowel bar after payment is constructed that is a major question tolerance we can fit in but how do i measure that for that if you again go to the irc 15 2017 there is another procedure given magnet pulse induction mi mpi you can also refer astm standard there is a frequency is also given in irc 15 checking frequency 
more than 25 percent of percent of the joints it is given it means it has to be checked but sometimes this particular device is not available now i have the video but you can also see on the youtube i would not play it here because the time is, is running out so this is how the device look like but i will show you some interesting finding from this this is the interesting finding for this particular device now you see here this is your dowel bars number of dowel bars you can scan it and if you see the depth here we have plus minus 25 mm tolerance so let's for example this is 310 mm mid depth is 150 mm so i have the tolerance within this range i see everything is fitting well but these two dowel bars are not fitting well it means it is around 202 204 204 yes i see the rotation less than 10 mm i see i think everything is okay everything is satisfying and sometimes you see plus and minus sign right here that depends upon whether it is you know like up and down clockwise anti-clockwise it depends upon what kind of sign convention that you want to adopt and this is you can calculate the spacing of the doll bars so this is how important this particular instrument is just to check the the doll bar alignment into the field and then you can think about the load transfer efficiency and then you can link it but how does it really make sense to you but I, as i told you the sometimes that this particular device is not available now if it is not available i have also seen people doing this kind of practice they just try to expose the concrete in one meter of width and try to see the how the towel bus look like but this is again i mean this is not very 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 handy procedures for doing it but yes this is the practice that we follow it with this particular slide i just conclude my presentation i think i have taken almost five to seven minutes more and i hope you could get some interesting findings from this dr amar yeah yes yes actually very interesting presentation so i i will talk to you so maybe personally like i'm also working in uh, in, in this area like mainly on misalignment of developers i'll talk to you personally sure sure yeah no problem yeah uh, participants, if you have any questions, you may uh, please put it in chat box so that uh, that then we will launch it. Yes, I have. Hmm. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Then we there is question at ten forty eight in contraction time. Do we need seating? Uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, can you see my screen number or no 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 not no, no. Achha, achha. okay okay fine fine so yeah. what is the question tell me again yeah in contraction times do we need to provide seating on the double bar Contra yes of course seating has to be there everywhere then everywhere all the time yes yeah, another question sir you mentioned design is what you is that? You meant uh, 10 9, you, uh, sorry, 11 9, you just take it. Um, ah, right, 11, okay. 11 9, 11 9. Uh, you mentioned about design years in one of the slide. Please explain what is it. Uh, I, I don't remember uh, what was the, what is the question. So maybe maybe what what Amar they can do they can personally contact me they can send uh, questions and all so that's not a problem uh, I'm going to the next question why the joints should cut in early hours of the concrete payment I think if you are really wondering question of this answer then you should definitely go through the basics because there is a very simple logic behind that the concrete will shrink you are going to see the issues and then it will crack the tension you know like the stress will develop. So you have to really cut down as early as possible. Typically eight to twelve hours, but sometimes it can be less than that, depending on the weather conditions. Mm. Then last question, you can see that will there be any effect on LTE if dowel bar is? Uh, no. Oh, oh, uh, one more question is there: Can we put dowel bar in two layers? What do you mean by the dowel bar in two layers? I could not understand that. Uh, I'm not sure what 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 do you mean by the two layers actually. I mean the layer one layer above another layer. Layer. I could not understand that question. Perhaps 
maybe the two layer uh, the maybe that that can't can't be solved it become a pop no it mean it mean it mean the two layer construction right payment construction yeah yeah, yeah. oh po possible that that's what you have to make the slots and everything has to be done actually yeah uh then there is a question will there be any effect of lt the double body eccentric embedded yes i think that's what we have seen right we have seen in the last last slide the alignment how it, it uh, powerful it is please tell us the effect of curling on lte uh remember in one of the slide i showed you if it is curling up your joints are going to be tighten up little bit if your joints are going to tighten up your one slab is going to support other slab so definitely they are not going to allow a lot of deflection so in that case you may find little bit higher lt so that the reason i told you that you have to very very careful where you are going to measure the load transfer efficiency okay uh, dharmveer actually it's a very good presentation i i also have one doubt suppose in your yeah. uh, axle load fraction you said uh, for the maximum weight load should be taken for the design of the development right one, right right one, one mm -hmm. kilometer right okay, so the same axle weight in the same axle load fraction i have seen in case of the tandem axle we have the uh, both combined uh, uh, axle load tandem axle load was, was like 400 kilometer mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. take it on each axle it should be approximately 200 kilometer right so whether single axle to be taken or tandem axle load to be taken for the design of the double bar that is actually practically uh, somebody asked uh, this person when i was designing one of this pavement <laughs> that is very good question amar actually yeah because logically if you see you see the load is more there also right yeah. but i think if you go go back to the theory of that that how the load is getting distributed among the axles and uh, how the moment is going to get generated the shear force and all so i'm i i don't have the real clear cut answer of that but uh, what i have seen in the literature that uh, the impact of the single axle is more as compared to the tandem axle so i would not really uh, uh, put lot of weight on the tandem and tridem actually yeah, yeah that's what actually uh, some uh, like feeling that they have asked me this question right so right the problem is uh, when you have the tandem axle there is a like uh, uh, so it will be it will be more conservative actually in fact if you go that way round then uh, you, you in fact what happens axle load inspector is also very tricky somebody may report somebody may not report the high load so uh, if you can catch it from the tandem and trinum that is okay in one way right okay that will uh, let me just uh, provide concluding the remark dr darmi singh has started his presentation by explaining the purpose of providing double berth in digit pavement an important of facing up double bus this was also one of the very interesting uh, 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 like that i have listened today like providing the spacing um, uh, like you can provide the, uh, less spacing under the wheel path and you can increase the spacing in the, the center of the uh, maybe slab then that thing explained the load transferring mechanism of the joints in the digit frame due to various types of joints such as i can i can get interlocking and double joints Like Singh described the material requirements for double berth and relevant portal provisions. Like Singh beautifully demonstrated the placement of double berth by DBI and uh, manually. Like Singh explained the design of double berth as per IAS specification. In that he elaborated how to select the maximum wheel load from the axle load spectrum, influence of concrete and steel parameters, subgrade such as support on the double berth. Like Singh had also demonstrated. Uh, testing requirements that is one of the very important point generally we take the um, like a, the uh, double bars of a different area and, and generally nobody concentrate on this uh, testing testing requirements is also important testing requirement before placing the double bars some practical issues in placing placing of double bars so then dr singh described on the importance of lte and various factors which affect the lte at the end he nicely explained impact of alignment of a uh, uh, double bars at the times Thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Darmin, for your wonderful presentation. Really, I enjoy a lot. You and I think the participants also so they must be enjoy a lot of your presentation. Yeah. Thank, thank you, thank you, Dr. Amar. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, and uh, th thank you for pushing me actually because I, <laughs> I was, I was, you know, like trying to uh, get more time from you. But thank for pushing me, and then you know, like working on this particular presentation. Yeah, appreciate it.
Okay. Thank now you. We're actually, yeah. our friend, uh, Mr. Suresh, uh, is going to deliver now. Oh, okay, Suresh. okay. Suresh. Yeah. Hi, uh, Dharmapit. Good morning. Hey, hey, good morning, Suresh. How are you? Yeah, I'm yeah, fine, fine. So, there is a lot of information in our presentation. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, some of the things uh, I learned from your presentation. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Because you know, we never, we never see the doll bus designs uh, like this. Just we oh. will take the values and uh, calculate it, and we are giving the designs. Right, right, right. So right. no yeah. one is bother about how they are going to construct and what are the factors affecting the doll bus and the yeah. low transfer efficiency. Yes. It was a mind blowing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Suresh. You are always, you know, like very kind and encouraging, actually. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I think I think I should not block your way now, actually, right? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> actually, Suresh, Dharmir Suresh is presenting on uh, like analysis of uh, for stresses in rigid pavement. Great, great. I think he is the pioneer in that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. He worked with uh, uh, Professor Pandey, and we should remember yeah. him. Actually. Yes, good, so, good, good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then, okay so I'm, then I'm, I'm uh, going, uh, living now, and then uh, good luck, uh, Suresh, and thank you, Am Amar. Right. See you later. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Darumit. No, sorry. Uh, like, sorry. Suresh. Yeah. Uh, just we will give some of a five minute break, Suresh. Yeah. No problem. So we will start we'll meet at 11:25. 25 will meet. Okay. Yeah, sure. Participant, yeah. please take five minutes break and uh, uh, please join shop by 11:25 uh, because we, uh, otherwise, uh, if you join after uh, like uh, starting the presentation, it's creating a lot of disturbance. So I request you kindly join by 11:25. 11:25 will start for sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Suresh. Yeah. Yeah, I am. Uh, welcome, Suresh. Yeah. So I am happy to uh, introduce Mr. Suresh Kittipati. And uh, he was my junior at IIT Kharagpur. And uh, he did uh, a post, post graduation in transport engineering from IIT Kharagpur. He has around 19 years of total experience. In that 17 years of reach and relevant experience in the fields of highway engineering, planning and design, improvement engineering, and uh, project management, including preparation of detailed engineering designs and drawings. He has extensively worked in the areas of highway design, improvement evaluation, improvement design, and construction of various projects funded by NHAI and international funding agencies like Asian Development Bank, ETC. He has been extensively involved in technical feasibility preparation of detailed engineering designs for major highway and expressways. He is uh, convergent with the current highway design practices like our uh, high practices IRC, UK DMRB, NRA DMRB, and ASHTO, and pavement design philosophies and maintenance practices. The maintenance practices. He has thorough knowledge and usage of latest highway design software like MX Road, VHI, and Optex. He was involved in several pavement evaluation studies and was responsible for design of rehabilitation strategies for in-service pavement. He has excellent experience in all kinds of engineering data collection pertaining to highways using sophisticated equipment like short stations and GPS. He was involved in several projects in consisting of preparation of detailed engineering design and drawings including horizontal alignment, vertical profile, super elevation design, pavement design, quantities and cost selection and alignment options, formation of improvement options, prioritization, economic evaluation, sensitivity analysis. Acted as a team leader and overall coordinator in all the activities of our highway steering committee and involved in conducting site surveys to steering committee meetings and inception, inception report to detailed project report creation. It is conducted almost all types of highway and pavement surveys, including topographical surveys, road network inventory, pavement condition, reflection measurement, DCP test, Roughness survey using sophisticated instruments like Ronda, test pit evaluation, and local graph survey, and all kinds of topic and analysis. He published four technical uh, papers. I can say it's a very good technical papers. So, based on his work only, like we have right now the IRC uh, 58, in uh, four technical papers in Indian uh, uh, Road Congress Journal and various international conferences, and one of the Contributed for revision of IRC 58 2011 code book and of course the latest code book of IRC 58 2016. So I welcome uh, uh, Suresh uh, for delivering the presentation. Suresh, please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Amar. Uh, thank you, the co organizers, for giving me this opportunity to present the stresses in uh, concrete payments. Uh, are you seeing my presentation? Yes, yes, yes but you just uh, um, like, uh, yeah, slide, slide slow. You put it in slide slow mode. Yes, yeah, now work okay, fine. Good, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm going to present only on the stresses in the concrete payments uh, due to various load conditions like uh, sulfate of the slab. And the temperature variation, nothing but a temperature gradients from the top of the slab to bottom of the slab. And hard one was the uh, wheel loads. So if you see the presentation, the introduction and the structural behavior of concrete payments under various load conditions, then the methods, how to computate, how to find out the stresses in the concrete payments, and then the latest developments of computer program KGP Slab 2 with the finite element modeling with the eight noded and 20 noded elements, how that performing with eight noded and 20 noded. And the modeling of temperature gradients. And finally, after the computer program is completed, generally, you know, you know software also, when, do, when they do the computer programming, they will do the testing. On the same way, here we need to do the test or validate the computer program which we've written. And then finally, needs to analyze the stresses which actually correlate to the field conditions. 
So these are the topics mainly uh, I am covering in this presentation. So coming to the introduction, nowadays uh, concrete pay payments are using in both uh, low volume roads and the high volume roads to provide maintenance free payments over a long period of the time. Maintenance free means uh, maybe a, a period of five years or seven years or 10 years. Compared to uh, you know flexible payments, these are maintenance will be very less in the rigid payments and, and no maintenance for the long periods. So people are preferring to go with the concrete payments nowadays widely in the country, in the various uh, state, state governments or central government or private agencies also doing. So if you see here, uh, I'm presenting a typical trust, which normally used in the high volume roads. There will be a subgrade of 500 mm to the compacted to the uh, compaction levels, which are specified in the guidelines. And over that a drainage layer, is it is the most important layer, is called as GSB, grander subbase. And over the top, it is a DLC layer because we require a strong foundation beneath the PQC to stand alone without any deflections or deformations. And over the top, we are providing a separate membrane like a uh, 125 microns, uh, you call it as a plastic sheet, generally they call it as. And over the top, we are laying the PQC, rigid pavement of 250 mm to 300 and 320 mm. Because of this separation membrane, frictional stresses will reduce. Because of that one, a separation membrane is introduced between the concrete pavement and the DLC. Coming to the structural behavior of concrete pavements with the various load combinations, uh, firstly, we need to take care of the self weight of the slab, how it affects the concrete structural behavior. And the second one was wheel loads. Under the wheel loads, how the CC payments will behave. And third one is temperature variation through the depth of the slab is nothing but a temperature gradient, not the temperature differentials, uh, you know, uh, a temperature. This is, this is the temperature gradient along the depth of the slab. The, the top, what is the temperature? On the bottom of the slab, what is the temperature? The difference is this, called as a temperature gradient. And then the fourth one was shrinkage of concrete at early age of construction. And fifth one was volume changes in foundation. These last two will have a less influence on the stresses in the concrete pavement. So these two, uh, in this discussion, we are neglecting and we are focusing only on the top three. See, these are diagrams, if you see, there is a temperature gradient always in the slab during daytime, nighttime, at any point of the time, slab will curl upward or downward, or sometimes it will remain same, contact, full contact with the, whatever the foundation you call or with the subgrade. If you see the daytime curling, it will be convex upward due to the self weight if you see the arrows self weight will always be pulling the slab to down because of this there is a compression compression on the top and tension on the bottom this is the temperature gradient because of this this will occur the slab will warp like this during the daytime and and coming to the nighttime curling because of temperature drops then the top of the slab will have the less temperature compared to the bottom of the slab. Then the slab will warp like concave upward, just reverse to this uh, temperature. This is the nighttime curling. So temperature will be there always because of the self weight of the slab, the stresses are generating at the top of the slab and the bottom of the slab. And going to the second case, here also, temperature gradients are there always on the concrete slab. I'm, I'm looking only at the critical wheel load location I'm showing here. I'm not showing the other wheel locations, means the wheels are placed exactly at the center of the slab. Then only this is the critical one for the bottom of cracking. 
during the daytime. Tension will be at the bottom, compression will be on the top. And during the night time, if you see, the slab will curl upward, and this is the critical locations, two locations of the load. If you place it here, then the cracks will occur here. So tension will be on the top and compression will be on the bottom. So how to find out the stresses in the concrete pavement? There are several methods in the industry to find out the stresses. Now here I am elaborating and taking only the theoretical analysis done by the Westerlord and the Bradbury because these two equations or methods are broadly uh, several, like you know, several uh, years from early 90s to I think uh, recent 10, 20 years back also, these methods are used. So I am focusing only on these two approaches, how they did the analysis, what are the assumptions in the analysis and the limitations and the shortcomings. So first I will go with the Western load analysis for load stresses. What are the limitations and assumptions he did in the analysis? First, he taken the thickness of the slab is constant. And second is each panel of the pavement is assumed to be fairly large and as yet uncracked. He taken a long and broad slabs and it is uncracked. And the load is, it means that the load is assumed in no case to be close to more than one edge or joint, only in one, one edge or the joint. Other edges are, or joints are assumed to be far enough away to have only a negligible influence on the stresses directly under the load. This is the, one of the important assumptions he taken. And the third one is, the subgrade is always in full contact with slab. This assumption also a, plays a major role in the assumptions and in the crystal guard equations. But in practical, the slab, when the warp up, warp down, some portion of the slab will lose the contact with the subgrade or you can find uh, for, uh, uh, our foundation, you can call it as, it, it loses the contact with the foundation. So this assumption implies that the reactive pressure between the slab and the subgrade always exists, no matter how the slab deflects. If the slab deflects upward at certain point, the reactive pressure at that point will pull downward. The subgrade will pull the slab down, means. So these are the limitations and the assumptions. With these assumptions, he given the solutions at three cases in 1926 in uh, edge and the interior and the corner. Later on, the Western God himself is revised his equations and he modified the things in 1943 and 48 to uh, correlate with the realistic uh, payment designs. Therefore, this approach is acceptable as a fundamental one for the design of concrete pavements. Most of the countries uh, is used the Westerlord equations at the initial stages to find out the wheel load stresses and the temporary stresses. And in 1948, he himself modified the edge loading. In earlier, he taken half of the thing. Now he taken the full wheel load at the edge and the interior. These are the equations given by the Western God on the latest stages is modified by the Teller and the Sutherland in 1970s, I think. And they given the equation for the uh, edge loading stresses, how to find out with this equation. And the same equation is recommended in IRC 58-2002 for calculation of edge load stresses. For corner loading, again, the Westergaard equations has been modified by the Kelly and he given the equation uh, in this form to find out the corner wheel load stresses. And the same equation has been recommended by IRC 58-2002 for the corner loading stresses. 
coming to the uh, Westergaard analysis for temperature stresses. And he, he taken some of the assumptions on this uh, temperature stresses also to find out. See, these, these are the uh, assumptions done by the Westergaard in 1926. Temperature varies linearly in the thickness of the slab. But if you see the practically, temperature varies nonlinear. So he taken assumption that the temperature is varies through the thickness in linearly. Then the subgrade acts as a wrinkler foundation consisting of series of springs. He taken a wrinkler foundation model for the subgrade means the you know a foundation. Slab and the subgrade are always in full contact. There is no gap when it curls up or curls down. Always it is contact with the uh, foundation fully. So with these uh, assumptions, he given the uh, solutions for three cases. Again, see, slab is infinite in both and x and y directions. It means the long and broad slabs. He analyzed it first with the long and broad slabs, but practically only the finite slabs we are doing uh, in the field. But initially he taken long and broad slabs and he given the moments on the stresses, tensile stresses for the slabs in X and Y direction. And case two is slab is infinite in plus Y and plus or minus X directions. So he defined means infinite in plus Y means minus Y he, he, he put is a finite one. Then he given the solutions for the tangential stresses in X direction and Y direction. And case three, he taken slab having finite width. He two directions he fixed it is a finite width and infinite length. He given two directions infinite. So accordingly, he given the equations for the tangential stresses for the temperature in X direction and Y direction. And with this, there are some shortcomings of the, to follow the Westergaard equations. These are the shortcomings. It cannot account for the nonlinear material behavior of rigid pavement systems. It overestimates the stiffness of concrete slab by assuming an infinite or semi-infinite plate. So these are the shortcomings. And later date, Broadbury came in picture and he given the equations for the Westergaard formula only with simplicity, he modified the things and he introduced the Broadbury coefficient so that uh, uh, the uh, Westergaard equations has been modified. Slab, he considered Broadbury slabs are finite and he introduced the coefficients for the simplicity because in the practical also slabs are finite only. You see 3.5 by 4.5 or 4 by 4.5 or 4.5 by 4.5. There are finite slabs only. For that purpose, he introduced one coefficient for the simplicity to calculate the temperature stresses. In both Westergaard and Bradbury, temperature gradient is considered as linear. There is no non-linear analysis here. They did both of them is a linear uh, temperature gradient along the depth of the slab. If you see this, uh, this slide, limitations of Bradbury, here also, he assumed the springs always contact with the slab when the curl upward, uh, curl downward, see the springs here. So always contact with the foundation. Slab is always contact with the foundation. This is the main assumption and subsequently we will see how this will change uh, practically. So he given the equations at the edge and the interior cases. Uh, these are the popular equations, recent times also we are using this and with the introduction of Bradbury coefficient to the temperature stresses. And if you see the Shortfalls means IRC 58 2002. It also recommends the Bradbury equations. What are the limitations of the IRC 58 2002? Wheel load stresses and 
temperature stresses are linearly additive. It means that you calculate the wheel load stresses separately with the Wester rod or some other charts are available. Or on temperature stresses with differently with the Bradbury equations, and you club up both, and then find out the maximum stress. This is this is the limitation of the IRC 58 2002. This condition is valid when there is a full contact between the pavement and the subgrade. Subgrade means always it is a foundation. Uh, uh, here it is uh, on the top of the RLC. But generally this condition occurs only if there is no temperature variation through the depth of the slab. If there is a constant temperature variation, then this is fine. If there is a temperature variation is linear, uh, the contact will not be there with the foundation uh, there is a gaps will occur between the slab and the foundation in the real field conditions. So with these limitations, how to overcome? This is the only solution is available uh, is to go with the computer programming with three-dimensional finite element modeling. There are many three-dimensional finite element modelings are available in the industry uh, to correlate with the actual field conditions of the behavior of the concrete payments. So here, in this, I'm going to cover the computer program, which was developed in the IIT Karakpur, named as the KZP Slab 2. And it was written in the Fortran. And the program is models a finite slab. Whatever size you want to put, you can make it 3.5 by 4.5, 4.5 by 4.5, whatever and it is rested on the Wrinkler Foundation. And it allows wheel loads as well as thermal loading. Wheel loads and thermal loading simultaneously at the same time it allows. And it takes care of full subgrade support as well as loss of subgrade support. Means the foundation, full foundation support or if the, it losses some foundation support also due to the thermal loading, it takes care of this program. And now I am going to how the program has been developed and how it is validated and then uh, stresses find out from the computer program. See, coming to computer program development. The computer program has been developed with the two uh, elements. One is with the eight noded element and another with the 20 noded element. You see here, eight noded isoparameter brick element. We have eight elements, uh, nodes here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. These are the eight nodes available. This is the local coordinate system and this is the Cartesian coordinate system. If you go to the 20 noded isoparametric brick elements, there are eight corners or eight nodes and then every midpoint has a, another node introduced, so nine, 10, 11, 12, it comes to 20 total nodes here. So this is the partition coordinate system. With these two, actually, we verified the computer program with eight noded and 20 noted brick element with available solution, critically available solution, so that our computer program is giving uh, good results are not are correct or not, we will validate the computer program. In this process, we take in a straight cantilever beam loaded with a point load of 10 kilonewtons at the free end in the vertical direction and taken E equivalent to 2 into 10 to the power of 3 kilonewtons per centimeter squared and mu equivalent to 0 and this cantilever beam is divided into three elements. In the each case, means the eight noded case also three elements, 20 noded case also three elements, and five elements in the eight noded also, and in the 20 noded also. You can see it here. This is the three elements, this is the five elements. These are the three elements for the 20 noded, and this is the five elements for the 20 noded and find it out the deflections and the moments what it is giving. If you see this slide, the comparison of uh, vertical deflections from the far end means at the free end, deflection will be more in the cantilever 
if critical if you calculate it comes to 0.2963 if you see here the results of three noded sorry three elements five elements of eight noded or with 20 noded three elements or five elements it's coming the same more or less there may be a difference of three to four percent not more than that sometimes it is giving 100 percent absolutely same as the theoretical and with the computer program but if you see the comparison of bending stress bending stress will be more on the fixed end the cantilever beam at the free end is zero so at the same way we got the results also in with the computer program has been compared with the theoretical values absolutely it is matching with the theoretical values of the computer program so going to another validation we did the validation of the program in the place with the different edge conditions so if you see here uh, there are four cases case one is uh, simply supported case two is fixed at the one edge and three edges are free case three is fixed two edges and the other two edges are free case four is completely fixed all four edges has been fixed and calculated the uh, deflections on this and these are all tabulated this is the example which we taken there are so many validations has been done i am showing you only one or two only uh, to know how the program to be validated so we taken a 2 meter by 2 meter slab rested on a rigid foundation and having the modulus of elasticity 3 to 10 to the power of 5 kg per centimeter square Bias ratio 0.3. The entire slab was loaded with uniform pressure 0.1 kg per centimeter square, and the thickness of slab has been taken 15 centimeters for thin slabs. We taken. So there is the uh, uh, deflections came from the computer program KGP slab two. If you can see here, uh, our case one, two, three, four is a simply supported slab. See, there is only a change of three to plus or minus three to four percent plus or minus the vertical deflection scale. Then we thought the program is running correctly, so we can go with the other analysis part. So during the analysis, this is the uh, one of the findings uh, why we went for the eight noded and the twenty noded programming because uh, if you go with the more nodes. Maybe it gives the accurate values. That is the thought. We thought that we will go with first eight noded and twenty noded, then compare the both models, which is giving giving the best results. So we will do the analysis with that one. So during the analysis, it is found that the twenty noded program is taking greater time compared to eight noded program. Maybe three to four times more than the eight noded programming. But this may be. Uh, because of 20 noded element program has large amount of data in the form of nodal data and nodal connectivity as compared to eight noded element program. Then we came to a uh, conclusion that which which uh, uh, element we need to take eight noded or 20 noded. Then we did the comparison of eight noded element and 20 noded uh, element subsequently. See, we taken a slab which is resting on the regular foundation with the finite uh, uh, slab in the width and uh, uh, length also 3.55 meters is a square slab we taken and we taken the single wheel loads varying from 8 to 16 tons means 8, 10 or 8, 9, 10 whatever you want to take 8 to 16 we vary with the two uh, additions of 8, 10, 12, 14 and 16 tons. The subgrade modulus of reaction we take in 8 to 15. And for the various thicknesses, 200 mm, 250 mm, 260 mm, 280, 290, 300, we did the various analysis with the uh, 8 noded element and with the 20 noded element with the, find the stresses on the wheel loads. And this is the beautiful uh, results it came in both the cases. 8 noded, 20 noded, the results more or less same. There is no much variation on this one. If you take slab thickness of 20 or 30 
or 25 and with different uh, edge uh, means uh, subgrade reactions k values if you vary and with uh, different single axial loads if you see we see single axial loads 8 10 12 14 16 this is the 8 noted uh, brick element and this is the 20 noted brick element there is no much difference on the stresses edge load stresses more or less same and here also with the higher modulus of subgrade reaction also there is not much changes uh, for the 8 noted and the 20 noted programming this if you see the 30 centimeters thick slab also if you compare with the 8 noted and 20 noted computer program results more or less uh, it's matching so we concluded that 8 noted element is the uh, which uh, we need to take because of the faster results. Uh, there is no much change on the uh, stresses in the 20 noded compared to 8 noded. So we taken the 8 noded element for the final modeling of stresses. Again, we verified the 8 noded program with the available solutions in our case in the cement concrete payments, Westerwald and Bradbury solutions. We have available. So we compare with the Westerwald uh, uh, equation, how it comes the stresses with the, you know, compared with the computer program. So Westerwald low stresses, what are the assumptions he taken by the Westerwald? Same assumptions had been loaded in the programming and taken the deflections and the bending stresses with the different uh, uh, runs with the L by L ratios. If you see here, it is uh, changing and the B by L ratios are changing with the different uh, combinations. We find out the stresses, stresses same. See, for any change in L by L or B by L, there is no change in the Bradbury, uh, sorry, in the Westerlgaard equation edge load stresses, bending stresses is the constant, 41.81, 41.81. If you see the computer program is given different values, but it is matching almost all. If you see with the finite slabs, it is uh, is coming 41.81, it is 40, more or less same. So deflections, this is an interesting find out, uh, you can see here the deflections. Stresses are coming more or less same, but the deflections, if you see the deflections, 0.7 constant in the Westerwald. But in the KGP slab, if your L by L ratios are less, means the finite slabs, deflections are more. If you go L by L ratios are higher, if you see the serial number 20, run number, then you see the deflections. Uh, this is the ratio of KGP slab on this. So this is a 14% higher results it came. Here, if you see, is the 30 percent higher deflection scale, and the same thing has been compared with the Bradbury also. And this temperature has been modeled in the FEM final method, and the same assumptions we have been taken for the Bradbury what he taken. The weightless slab is bonded to spring foundation to simulate the assumptions of Bradbury. And if you see this closely, these diagrams, this is the concrete slab, means uh, uh, the depth of the slab, is the uniform temperature change. Say, uh, example, at the morning time, if you see the uh, concrete uh, having the uniform uh, temperature all along the depth of the slab, say 25 degrees, and then if, if going on to the you know, uh, midday, it comes to, say, 45 degrees on the top, on the bottom, maybe it comes to uh, 25, say 5 degrees change uh, here, here the change is 25 degrees. See, so this is the uniform temperature is 5 degrees and the linear variation temperature is 25 uh, degrees Celsius. So, due to this linear temperature variation, we quantified the forces and applied on the nodes on this converting the stresses acting over the faces into equivalent nodal forces and applied on the model and taken the stresses. This is the one example I'm showing here. We've done uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, combinations with the different sizes of uh, slab and different thicknesses with different temperature variations. Uh, with this one, one of them uh, I'm you know, uh, showing here. 
the rectangular slab having 3.5 by 4.5 size, modulus of elasticity 29,430 mPa, poisons ratio 0.15. Coefficient of thermal expansion, 1 into 10 to the power of minus 5 for degrees Celsius. And with the linear temperature differences of 13 degrees plus or minus daytime and nighttime, are the same 17 degrees plus or minus, then 21 degrees plus or minus. Thickness of the slab, 200, 250, 300. And the density of the concrete taken, 2,400 kg per meter cube. And with this, if you see the uh, figures over here, the edge slab stresses received for thickness of 200 mm and modulus of separate reaction is 78 meganewtons per meter cube. This is the Bradbury, this is a straight line, the Bradbury uh, uh, stresses, temperature stresses, and this round ones was KGB slab to program, program the, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the results from the program. And if you see the interior slab also, with this, uh, a particular slab thickness and with this particular subject reaction, it also both are matching. I can I can show you in the tabular form for the better understanding a comparison of stresses, edge warping stresses, and also interior warping stresses with the different temperatures of 8, 13, 17, and 21. And in daytime, nighttime, plus or minus. More or less, only here, if you see only 2% change, it means difference is there with the Bradbury and the KGP slab to edge warping stresses. And the interior warping stresses, daytime, nighttime, there is only a 1% difference between the you know theoretical value and the uh, programming values. So with this, we validated the program you see the 300 mm thick, thick slabs also is the only 1% change, means the difference is there. Here only 2%. So there is, is a, absolutely the computer program we can use for the different uh, conditions which relating to the field. So with this validation, we went forward and did the modeling of the computer program with the realistic conditions by taking the self weight of the slab, loading the wheel loads, thermal loading, all together, combinedly. There is no separate analysis for self weight, separate analysis for wheel load, separate analysis for thermal loading. No, all combinedly. Three will act at a time. It's more realistic model than the, you know, Westergaard and the Bradbury. So the computer program has been modeled for the finite slab on Winkler Foundation. It allows wheel loads as well as thermal loading, and it takes care of loss of support also because of the thermal loading uh, in the daytime and nighttime because of the curl warping up or warping down. Some portion of the slab will be loss of support with the foundation. This this has been taken care in the modeling uh, uh, to measuring the deflections. If any deflection is coming in the slab, plus or minus, we remove the separate reaction on that nodes. And again, the program has been done. The program has been modeled like that. It will iterate and come to the stage that there is no uh, further iteration is required. So first time, if one node is uh, uh, you know, a loss of separate support, and then next time it comes two or three, like that, it will come to the standstill. And at that time, some of the nodes are not contact with the foundation, and others are contact with the foundation. It is the more realistic model has been developed, and extensive research has been done by the IIT Kharagpur. Uh, this is based on my thesis only, MTech thesis. In 2004, I completed. Later on, there are you know, subsequent research has been done with the different uh, conditions. I'm not talking on that one here. Only the basics, how the program has been developed for the self weight of the slab, taking the care of the curling, the daytime, nighttime. And these are the temperature gradients. This is the important one here introduced in this model, nonlinear variation. If you see here, this is the nonlinear variation. If you see practically also, if you measure the temperatures at different depths, 
from the top to bottom or bottom to top temperature will vary non linearly this is the non linear and this is the constant temperature gradient the tom uh, we divided into two parts one is the constant varying uh, 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 of uh, temperature gradient and the non linear portion and again this non linear portion has divided into three deltas two deltas with full depth linear variation and one delta with the half only top half portion we uh, divided into this with this the model has been modified to take care of the linear variations and this is a critical wheel load which i shown in the initial uh, stage during the daytime curls downward and the wheel load placed here this is the critical one this has been analyzed tension will develop on the bottom uh, compression on the top this is called as during the daytime bottom up cracking and this is the top down cracking during the night time this is the critical wheel load locations and with the different combinations of wheel loads and with the different uh, uh, combinations of the slab widths 3.5 4.5 3.8 3.94 4.5 or you know you can take it as uh, 3 3.5 whatever you want you, you need to make in the program itself initially itself you need to set the dimensions accordingly you need to make the elements in the program then it will take care of the length and the width of the slab and these are the axial loads and these are the different combinations single axial tandem axial this is the tridem axial these are the maximum stresses locations where you will get due to the wheel loads so with this uh, above frem analysis id correct quoted extensive research and it was uh, revised the code book in 2011 and 2015 as 58 has been revised some of the you know limitations of the approach and need future work uh, uh, why i am presenting this is there is a lot of research is required even though most of the things are covered mostly say i can say 82 to 85% is the accurate we we achieve there is a lot of research is required of the other 10 to 15% of the you know uh, uh, more uh, accurate results see here the plenty of research is needed to determine the modulus of subbase reaction k for different types of subbases for the payment there are different types of uh, subbases they have the subbase reactions are different for the different subbases that we need to be validate the assumption of that dnc subbase with plastic sheet on winkler foundation may not be a correct one because dnc have higher shear strength so winkler foundation is not the correct uh, you know exactly fits uh, uh, is the practical one then we need to model that one foundation as a solid elastic mass this is a more realistic one we need to think about need more research on this one and need a field test also fwd to necessary to get the better parameters in the payment design and the temperature this is one of the most important thing in the stresses find it out temperature and moisture distribution in the concrete slab must be studied all over india for correct evaluation of stresses only we have the charts in the irc in the state wise or region wise but uh, it may not be reflect the actual field temperature gradients this required a lot of research on the temperature gradients then the reliability concept this needs to be inbuilt in the design so these are to be overcome then our uh, models will be more strong to you know correlate the field conditions with this uh, i'll take you leave thank you
foundation so the contact area will be more because of that one stresses will be less if the subgrade reaction is less it means it has the flexibility to allow the concrete slab go into the foundation and have the more contact area in case of low uh, you know subgrade modulus of reaction if you get, if you go with the high modulus of subgrade reaction means the foundation is very lazy it is not allowing the slab to go down to the foundation to touch it so when it warps up or warps down more curl will be there means more loss of contact with the you know foundation so the stresses will be more that is the reason it is giving more stresses if you go with the most upgrade reaction yeah yeah up to 300 mm uh, 300 mm per meter the stresses are decreasing then afterwards uh, increasing that's what we have noticed uh, in the cards that are providing so so Suresh yeah yeah uh, that's it. so any other uh, questions uh, participants yeah uh, that's the question Suresh uh, what are the different techniques available to reduce the shrinkage stresses uh see this is the field related one uh, i can say some of the you know uh, suggestions uh, uh, during the you know construction you need to take care of the you know the uh, water content the first main important is the water content or to or what water content you are constructing and then the temperature at what temperature you are maintaining to meet during the construction itself otherwise due to the you know say there are high temperatures like in a day time you are casting the you know slab there is a temperature variations are more uh, eight temperatures on this one so the temperature difference of the eight temperature on the casting temperatures will be less so that the shrinkage cracks can be you know lowered uh in the design in this model uh, it's not uh, taken care of this i think uh, uh, yesterday reddy sir was saying that there is a, you know a uh, 5 degree curl will be taken care in the 2015 revision this is because of this one only because of the uh, you know that shrink case the slab itself will be after casting you know when it is you know uh, hardened then itself it will curl curl will be there means temperature gradient already it will be there in the slab yeah actually in the afternoon also we have a session exclusively on the concrete mix designs and uh, casting uh, uh, pavements and uh, how to control this water treatment ratio and the things you can of course ask the beach person in the afternoon session also okay so let me let me conclude Today's second session. Actually, Mr. Suresh, who is working as a, a director um, in uh, Samarth Infrain Techno Club Private Limited, Hyderabad, which is also one of the, I can say, very good consultancy company. So, in the, working in the areas of transport, different areas of transport and engineering. So, coming to this uh, presentation, like Mr. Suresh has started this presentation by explaining various types of stresses developed in the situation. Due to wheel load, calcium of the slab, and temperature, 
Mr. Suresh has explained the specific development of equations for calculating stresses in rigid pyramids and what are the limitations in it. And uh, Suresh has nicely demonstrated how to construct the FU model with uh, different elements, with the different elements for analysis of stresses in rigid pyramids with various combinations. Suresh has shown the results of finite element analysis uh, with the uh, various uh, combination of loading and uh, of course the uh, uh, temperature and, uh, and and they have how they have had validated at the end this is another very important aspect uh, i like from this presentation at the end it has thrown some light on various areas that uh, definitely need the research or further study so i thank suresh for your uh, wonderful lecture again and when i asked the suresh uh, immediately he said I have not delivered any such offer because you are uh, field engineers and you will come forward and deliver. Definitely, we will provide the opportunity. We at the uh, Academic Institute, we provide the opportunity. You please come and uh, come forward and deliver such lectures. And uh, planning to uh, soon planning to conduct one more program on exclusively on beginner student, right? So definitely, I'll invite uh, in that program also. I request you also come and deliver. Right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amar. I, I would like to tell you some points on you. Uh, he is my senior in diploma also. In, uh, he is the 92 batch and I was the 93 batch. From that time, I know him. And we traveled, uh, you know, uh, and again we met in the IIT Karakpur. Uh, he is my senior there, over there also. Yeah. And it's a good opportunity which you given to me to deliver the lecture on stresses. Fundamentals. What about I given in this? These are the fundamentals of how to find out the stresses by using the finite element methods. I, I request participants, uh, so Mr. Suresh shown some of the areas uh, which need immediate research. So if you are interested, you please carry out the research. And if you have any doubt, um, you talk to Suresh. About uh, two months, uh, two or uh, three months back, uh, we also, we both were also discussed, and uh, Suresh said, uh, he, he told me that we, uh, he wants to construct uh, some pyramids. Of course, uh, we both have decided to construct uh, some uh, test sections at different locations, different parts of the country. Suresh, actually, if you can see in, in our uh, FDP, uh, yeah. participants are from all 29 states. All oh. 29 states. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We have even uh, like uh, our AACT has limited uh, the number of the participants to 200. But we, okay. have, uh, we have taken a little bit more than uh, um, uh, we have asked for the permission for uh, accessing more than okay. 10 percent more only. So, mainly okay. to accommodate uh, the participants from different parts of the country, all the states, different parts yeah. of the country, that is accommodated. So, this is also like uh, anyway, I will be in touch with them. We have the contact number of the region. So, whatever the idea that we have about construction of test sections in different parts of the country. So that we will get the realistic data uh, related to the temperature that will yeah. be good for uh, developing. Yeah, temperature. because uh, we cannot correlate with the air temperature with the you know uh, with the uh, temperature of the concrete slab. So because of that one, yes, the research is required on the temperature gradients on the concrete pyramids. Oh, okay. So right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. For patience of listening. Thank you. Dear participant, next session will be at two thirty. Please join the session at two fifteen sharp. Thank you.